APEC CEO dialogues have concluded and world leaders are about to meet virtually with Malaysia as host of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Meeting amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Chinese President Xi Jinping addressed a virtual meeting. Senior officials from the 21 APEC economies met last week in preparation for the main event and promoted policies to be adopted collectively by the APEC economies which account for about 40% of the world's population and half of global trade. So what messages have world leaders delivered and what picture does that paint for future cooperation? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined in the Beijing studio by Professor Liu Baocheng from the University of International Business and Economics. We'll also cross live to Mr. Chen Han Varanev, President of the Asian Vision Institute and Professor Jeffrey Towson, host of Jeff's Asia Tech Class. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Pan Deng. Well, Professor, let's start with the theme of this year's APAC gathering, APAC reimagined priorities in the aftermath of COVID-19. What is the key messages you've been getting so far? Is it multilateralism? Is it cooperation? Or is it strong opposition to protectionism and unilateralism? I think it's strong advocate uh, of the multilateralism because uh, right now the protectionism or unilateralism is still looming very large that block the uh, prosperity that can be sought after by collective efforts. Uh, there are a number of motivations for protectionism. One is that, okay, for stronger economies who think or assume that they are being ripped off by uh, smaller economies, they close their door. And also for uh, weaker economies with capricious uh, ruling, and they would like to close the door and play uh, within their own turf. And third is that there are certain interest groups that may hijack politics, that uh, politicians may have to respond. But all of which is a matter of ethnocentricity, and that in the end can really uh, hurt their own interest, and also they hurt the, all the benefit for a shared economy and inclusive growth uh, among a community that can be you know, playing by the rule and play on a fair basis. Mm, talking about playing a major role, uh, Professor Towson, the United States is the world's largest economy and it has been playing a quite important role in APAC, but this year is kind of unusual, isn't it? Because on Friday morning, President Donald Trump missed his spot on, a, on, on the gathering and uh, this reminds us of last week's uh, ASEAN summit. He was supposed to deliver a speech there, but instead he sent uh, his national security advisor O'Brien to address the ASEAN summit, but this time um, there was no show from anyone in the U.S. Trump administration. Why is that? I mean, it's hard to predict or understand maybe why they're making these decisions. Perhaps in retrospect later it'll be clear, but I don't think we really know enough at this point. Uh, I mean, clearly the U.S. has, has been fundamental, very engaged with APEC over the years. But it does wax and wane with administrations and based on the circumstances. So it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm not sure we know what it means yet. <laughs> Perhaps we will in a couple of weeks. But, uh, don't you think it's um, actually a show of attitude at least? Um, I'm not totally sure. I think we have seen the U.S. fairly well engaged in Asia, the whole idea of greater Asia integration greater integration across the Pacific, both in trade and investment. I mean, the U.S. has been fairly staunchly supporting that for a long time. So, yeah, it's not clear to me, at least. Uh, Mr. Van Arith, uh, do you think that is actually the case during the Trump administration? Um, during the Trump administration, uh, we uh, could see the lack of interest of the President Trump in a multilateral institution. Uh, uh, we, can, we, 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 we saw the, his absence at the East Asia Summit and his reluctance to engage in other multilateral institutions. So uh, over the past four years, uh, APEC has been facing with the lack of leadership, uh, especially from Washington. So um, I, I think um, perhaps after this administration, the new administration coming in next year, so the U.S. could be able to revive the 
the role of the U.S. in uh, promoting this uh, regional uh, cooperation and integration. So, uh, since you mentioned that, this is also a critical juncture for the APEC grouping itself because this is uh, the gathering for the leaders to come up with this, their post-2020 vision as the earlier vision expires uh, this year. So, do you think uh, the grouping will have uh, something new in their vision in terms of leadership, in terms of implementation, in terms of consensus building? It's hard to say at this stage, but uh, it, it depends on the leadership at the capital city of the member states of APEC. Uh, so far, uh, we, we have some kind of political issue and geopolitical issue uh, between the members of APEC. So um, uh, again, I think the, the pandemic uh, has forced some country to work together, but at the meantime also divide uh, the, the, the countries. So, um, you know, looking forward, um, I think uh, the, the reality is uh, we need to work together, especially to promote this uh, regional economic integration cooperation, uh, strengthen regional supply chains, promote free flow of trade and investment, and of course moving forward to a digital economy. So APEC can play that potential role in moving the region forward to, toward more this kind of uh, digital uh, uh, economic uh, cooperation. Uh, Professor Liu, how disturbing is this geopolitical challenge mentioned by Mr. Vanarath in APAC uh, region? Uh, yes, the, uh, the reality is that there is vast differences in terms of the political construct, in terms of the uh, different pursuit and in terms of the attitudes towards the uh, superpowers like the United States and China. And uh, also there are uh, neighboring issues that are still going on. But having said that, all of them really have a consensus in order to uh, boost the uh, prosperity and creating a peaceful and particularly a enabling environment among businesses. They do need to, to get, uh, work together uh, on any front. So therefore, the basic consensus needs to be built and integration uh, through a fair way of exchanges, through reduction of the uh, trade and non-tariff barriers and facilitation of cross-border investment, and people can really benefit. And, in, and also in the end, when prosperity is there, that can really contribute the uh, peace within this region, which is utterly important. So let's be spe specific on uh, APAC's uh, post-2020 vision. Uh, how will it address uh, its unique advantage and competitiveness? Because we know there are quite some competitive arrangements and frameworks in this region. For example, the just assigned RCEP, which is the world's largest free trade deal. Yes, I think the early harvest is very important because uh, can people can be uh, more excited seeing the real deliverables. Uh, one is continued reduction of tariff. Uh, that can add into cost of uh, doing business in the end also can deprive consumers benefit and so this is particularly important during the uh, pandemic because that can easily be used or uh, misused uh, to uh, provide the uh, protectionism and uh, uh, the other is that uh, you know there can be uh, some concrete result in terms of facilitating cross-border investment because most of the uh, primitive FDAs would only address something on the border but uh, the backyard also needs to be uh, synchronized in terms of rule-based uh, governance so uh, you know the RCEP has also addressed that and then technical assistance and um, for, of course, sharing all the uh, technologies or, or uh, vaccines when it comes out uh, for basic humani humanity and also to support the friendship that I had, uh, that is really hard earned. And then also the, you know, when uh, our guest mentioned dig digital economy, because there is so much so a large potential uh, that needs to be unta un uh, untapped by collective efforts. And uh, fundamentally, I think still infrastructure development through connectivity, uh, either with roads or uh, with the uh, telecommunication, are uh, still the key uh, to bring people closer together in a cost-effective way. And talking about digital economy and techno technological 
uh, advancement in the region. Uh, Professor Towson, uh, what's the dynamics you've been getting from uh, where you are? Yeah, I think what's interesting, particularly about the regional economic partnership of last week, is, is the discussion is starting to move away from trade and investment, which is traditionally what these groups talk about, free and open trade and investment, a lot of tangible things moving across borders, uh, to more of the intangibles, uh, data, cross-border payments, talent, uh, advanced skill sets in, you know, sort of human capital, uh, IP protection, things like that. That's a lot more interesting in terms of going forward because that is where the world's going. You know, when we talk about a sort of interconnected Asia of 5, 10, 15 years from now, you know, a lot of that's going to be digital. It's going to be these intangible things, not, you know, putting things into shipping containers. That will happen too, but it's this other side that's, I think, the most exciting. Uh, Mr. Vanarath, talking about an uh, interconnected Asia and even the larger interconnected APAC region. What do you think is the biggest challenge here? Is it um, the differentiated developmental stages among economies or is it uh, the lack of sufficient infrastructure? I think uh, domestic politics matter the most because so far uh, the, under the WTO or APEC, uh, key cultural products has been uh, one of the most sensitive and complex issues because of the domestic politics. So how can APEC member states can push forward, uh, you know, the reforms of, let's say, subsidy to reduce subsidy on agricultural products, to promote promote more free flow of agricultural products across the region. So that that's really a very sticky issue that uh, we, we need to address. And the APEC members uh, they need to work together to have a uh, one voice on the the reform of the World Trade Organization which is now is under attack, uh, you know, um, because of the protectionism, uh, unilateralism, and the lack of uh, effective uh, diffuse settlement mechanism. Um, so so that, that is something that we need to work out. And then uh, after this uh, submit, I think the political leader need to go home, explain their constituents, their people about the benefits of promoting free trade uh, investment and the digital connectivity. So I think uh, this comes with uh, uh, to, to build consensus at the national level. So domestic politics really matters. Now, interestingly, you mentioned domestic politics. Uh, so how much is it also uh, related to geopolitics and U.S. Uh, influence? Uh, for example, Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong uh, mentioned recently that uh, his country doesn't need to pick sides between China and the United States. He even went further to say that very few small countries are interested in forming up alliances against China. What's the key message here? Uh, well, obviously, uh, foreign policy, including trade policy, uh, begins or starts at home. So I think uh, it depends on how the national leader defines their national interests uh, and then how they can connect uh, the national interests with the foreign uh, policy and trade policy. So across Southeast Asia, uh, including Singapore, they are not interested in taking sides. So that is very clear, crystal clear. Uh, so any major power that uh, intend or attempt to force them to take sides uh, would face the uh, kind of a, a setback. So, um, so that is the way forward uh, as a collective agency, ASEAN, for instance, can uh, navigate through this uh, geo ge geopolitical competition. And uh, we, we, we just want to stay neutral and independent from uh, major power competition. Mm. What about uh, domestic um, factors uh, to drive uh, growth? Uh, Professor Towson, earlier you mentioned digital economy, uh, technology, all those um, beautiful pictures for the, pi for the future. But what about right now, the impact of COVID-19? I think Thailand is uh, a quite good example to talk about this. Uh, tourism is uh, indeed a pillar for Thailand's economy, but it has been shattered by this year's uh, pandemic. And also, talking about domestic politics, the country is uh, facing some unrest uh, in its domestic politics. So what do you make of the situation? In terms of you know, interrelations between the region and in interconnectivity, obviously politics impacts certain things a lot more than others. Uh, tourism, which was, you know, in Thailand, it's, you know, let's say, 20% of the GDP, more or less. 
a lot of that came from uh, China in particular. That's all shut down and, uh, well, mostly shut down. There's not a lot to be done about that at the moment, but if you look at something, say, e-commerce, we just had Singles Day, uh, very successful, tremendous numbers, and that was China for sure, but it was also Thailand and Southeast Asia participated. So even in COVID, to some degree, there are more packages going through warehouses and uh, going around the region uh, now than ever before. So in that sense, uh, we're seeing things sort of move forward quite nicely. But yeah, COVID has a sort of a disparate impact on different sectors, uh, depending on what they are right now. So talking about uh, November the 11th, also known as uh, Singles Day, uh, Professor Liu, uh, let's talk about China's uh, domestic demand, because that is also an emphasis in, emphasis in President Xi Jinping's address to the APEC CEO dialogues uh, on uh, Thursday. Uh, what do you make of the potential here? Well, it took me quite a surprise that uh, I thought people could uh, uh, tighten their purse uh, during the single stay, and now you know it turned out to be quite a surge in terms of purchase. It means that China still enjoys a uh, higher level of savings rate, and uh, that uh, also that is also why uh, people are getting more compliant uh, with the uh, lockdown and uh, with wearing masks, etc., because they have confidence in what is in stock for them uh, for tomorrow's meal. So. And then, uh, you know, Chinese the domestic consumption uh, is getting far stronger, and also in terms of the service, uh, it's already exceeded uh, you know, more than 50 percent of the entire economy. So there is a solid reason for China to be more self-reliant, but uh, still uh, open to the uh, global trade and global investment. And this can give China a better uh, space to elevate its industrial structure and also to cater to people's uh, living standard uh, rates uh, in terms of the consumption and also in terms of the work decency. So you're saying that uh, China's potential, uh, it's China's market potential is also closely linked to its, to its next stage opening up? Absolutely, because the whole gist of the next five-year plan is to continue to provide a better quality life to uh, all Chinese people. Uh, we have uh, uh, full confidence by the end of the year we're going to live, uh, lift everybody in this country out of the poverty line. So that's the basic income. If you look at the market, it's not the people, but people with income. Uh, that really is a realistic market. Otherwise, it's a potential market. So uh, now, uh, on the other hand, uh, we continue to open a door with our import expo and uh, with uh, continuous reduction actually of the Chinese trade surplus to try to strike a balance. And uh, then we are also uh, opening our full arm for the digital economy by uh, robotization, by mechanization, by uh, boosting the Chinese ag agricultural production. So this way we do form a uh, sort of a, a virtuous cycle uh, you know, between the domestic marketplace and also the world community. Mm, talking about connectivity, Mr. Van Arith, uh, what do you make uh, of the infrastructure connectivity nowadays in, in the Asia Pacific? And uh, what do you think uh, the role China's Belt and Road Initiative can play in this? Uh, correctly, yes. Um, uh, infrastructure development and connectivity is very critical in promoting trade investment and people-to-people uh, -people, uh, connectivity. Uh, so far, uh, we have different initiatives and mechanisms, including the Bell and Road Initiative, the Free and Open Indo-Pacific. So uh, those, um, uh, even though competing in one way, but also complementary to each other in another way. And the uh, recipient country across the region uh, welcome uh, those both initiatives. So we could foresee uh, the, the continuity of uh, the engagement of major powers, including China, in uh, infrastructure development and connectivity, and the uh, improvement of quality and inf infrastructure, because China start talking a lot on quality infrastructure, quality investment, uh, quality growth. This is very, very positive for the region moving forward. I mean, because we are concerned more about the quality investment and infrastructure, especially from China. So has this uh, vision and process uh, been hampered by 
the pandemic. Of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the pandemic has disrupted many things, including the construction, uh, infrastructure development projects. Uh, but so far, uh, China uh, could make certain breakthrough in continuing the Belt and Road projects, such as building the rail in Laos uh, and the expressway in Cambodia and ports and airport and etc. So, so that, uh, that is quite remarkable uh, how a Chinese uh, corporation investing in infrastructure could maintain the momentum of their projects. Uh, uh, down the road, I, I would like to, to stress what uh, our uh, speak, uh, panelists here uh, stressed uh, earlier about the digital connectivity. This is, um, this is a new uh, territory for China and a new strategic space for China to further connect, uh, digitally connect China with the whole uh, Asian uh, region. And China has the capability and cap you know, resources to do so uh, uh, compared with other uh, powers. So this is a great opportunity for China to be the hub of uh, digital connectivity. Mm, talking about digital uh, connectivity, Professor Towson, this is also helping a lot during the pandemic because uh, the international travel has been basically uh, been a standstill uh, uh, among major countries of learning destinations. So, um, do you have any personal experience on this? Well, I think looking at the digital side of this, what was really impressive was particularly logistics in China over the past year. I mean, companies like JD and Tainiao really stepped it up and you know, upgraded their logistics facilities. They were moving things around the country almost immediately, whether it was medical supplies or food or whatever. You know, the last time a major pandemic came through with SARS, you know, 18 years ago, that didn't exist. So there was a really interesting response, particularly from the logistics uh, footprint of China, and then to some degree Asia, but I think China was ahead of the curve on this. That's what really got my attention, is how quickly they responded to this. So what about people-to-people -people exchanges? Because um, as the APAC this year, APAC meeting this year is taking virtually. And also this is happening to many classes uh, from primary to uh, college and higher education all around the world. Many things are taking online. Do you think this could be the next hotspot for growth? Well, it's, I mean, this was already happening. The, uh, the idea of digital interactions, whether payment, communication, engagement, collaboration, working, all of that. You know, when you have a disease whose defining characteristic is in-person interactions, you want to avoid those. Well, the go-to solution is digital interactions. I mean, it's, it is exactly the right place to look when you're trying to avoid in-person. And uh, we've seen that, you know, I think we've seen it accelerate quite a lot, but it was already heading down that path. This just gave it a pretty good jump forward. Right, now let's take a look at the big picture, dear guests. Um, according to the IMF, economic activity in the Asia-Pacific is expected to contract by 2.3% this year and uh, grow by 6.7% in the year 2021. That's compared to the minus 5.8% this year and 3.9 percent next year in advanced economies. What does this tell, Professor Liu? Well, uh, it's almost a year now uh, since the whole world is really experiencing, uh, experiencing the contraction in both their domestic economy and in the global trade. So this is the reality that everyone has to face. And uh, the, of course, uh, IMF and World Bank, they constantly adjust their prediction be, uh, due to the changes in the, uh, uh, the seriousness of the uh, pandemic and also uh, the different type of response from different countries. But definitely, uh, the virus will have to go away because uh, the vaccine, uh, you know, is uh, highly hopeful. So, uh, therefore, we do see that uh, uh, this is now the valley, and uh, uh, global economy is going to uh, climb out of this valley, and particularly now when it's low end, uh, we can really see a substantial increase and rebound uh, in terms of the economic, economic recovery. But uh, uh, we must caution that, uh, you know, some of the sectorial uh, differences are still there, and those who are hard to hate uh, like tourism, hospitality, etc., uh, takes far longer time to be repaired. 
But uh, in the meantime, we do also see some other industries because of this, as you mentioned about you know, the, uh, the uh, virtual conferencing, uh, online education, and they benefit a great deal in addition to e-commerce. So what's your take on the, this, Professor Towson? What's the unique uh, advantage uh, for this projected better for performance in the edge of Pacific? Well, I'm, I'm always a bit dubious about specific projections because we, we honestly just don't seem to be very good at it. I mean, we're, historically, we're not awesome at it because it's... But how about you know, this? Do you think uh, Asia-Pacific economies happen. are doing a better job in pandemic control uh, uh, compared to some advanced economies, for example, the United States? No, I, I wouldn't conclude that. I think it depends what metrics you're looking at and you're going to see different things region to region. So it's a little too sweeping in terms of... Um, what I think we can conclude at this point. We may be able to look back in several years and, and really take this apart, but it's, it's kind of hard to know right now. Right, Mr. Van Der Rith, uh, very quickly, what's your take on the projection? I think, uh, depending on the sectors, uh, we could see the, the momentous uh, growth of the ICT industry, vertical industry. So, um, so the those are the, the key drivers of growth uh, for the future economy in this region. That's why uh, digital connectivity, e-commerce uh, play a critical role because it is a new kind of engine uh, of growth for, for this region and it will have the region bounce back uh, stronger in uh, the following years. But as a uh, uh, previous speaker mentioned, I mean certain industries like tourism, hospitality industry, it may take another three, four years to bounce back. So uh, it depends on what sector we're talking about, but uh, I, I, I could foresee personally that this region is the most prom prom promising region in the world in terms of economic recovery. So, Professor Liu, we've talked about uh, a projection, but looking forward, realistically speaking, what do you think is the single biggest challenge to APEX in the near future? Uh, I think this, this is still, uh, you know, uh, lies uncertain with uh, the policy synchronization. And, uh, you know, uh, everyone speaks about the uh, political rhetorics, and, uh, but uh, um, many of them, those members are having their own agenda in addition to uh, the existing differences. So, therefore, uh, how we can really put play a rule-based uh, economic interaction, that also remains to be seen. So that is why I often advocate that uh, in order to really to bring people together, uh, you do need a dispute settlement mechanism, and so you do need uh, to have a whole set of rules. So, you know, look at WTO. You know, only when the, uh, when the dispute settlement body was there and uh, the uh, you know, the global trade can really surge. So therefore, to build a higher level of predictability and with a better enabling environment and a, a concerted political will, uh, we can really move farther forward. Thank you very much, Professor Liu Baocheng in our Beijing studio, Mr. Van Arath in Singapore, and Professor Towson in Bangkok. And that's it for this edition of Dialogue on CGTN. I'm Pan in Beijing. Bye-bye.